Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of This Week in Hearing. I'm Brian Taylor, and this week we have a special guest, probably the most well-known guest we've had in our program to date. Uh, he's someone from outside the profession. Uh, it's David Eagleman. Uh, David is a neuroscientist, CEO, professor, and author, and probably a few other things besides that. Uh, some of you might even be familiar with his work on PBS. I know that's where I uh, got to know uh, who he was from his PBS uh, series, uh, The Brain, back in maybe 2015 or 2016. Uh, so welcome, uh, Professor Eagleman. Great to be here, Brian. Thank you. Did I miss anything about your background that we should highlight? <laughs> You're a renaissance <laughs> nothing, man. <laughs> nothing important. All right. Well, um, I wanted, you've written several books. I mean, in fact, the last couple of nights, I've been reading your uh, Live Wired book. And uh, I wanted to start the conversation talking about the concept of uh, sensory substitution and what that really entails. Yeah. So this is this is something my lab has been studying for, you know, I guess, 15 years now. The idea is this. Your brain is locked in silence and darkness uh, in the skull, and it doesn't know what's out there. So it just has these different portals to the world where here it can collect electromagnetic radiation and here it can collect air compression waves and here mixtures of molecules. But these are all ways of trying to find important information sources from the outside world. All of this stuff gets converted into spikes, little electrochemical signals in the brain. And that's the language of the brain. That's all it has is spikes running around in the dark. But the key is it doesn't know where those spikes come from. It doesn't know, oh, these are from, these were originally generated by photons or air compression waves or molecules or whatever. So this led to this idea that actually maybe you could push information into the brain via unusual channels and the brain doesn't care where it originally came from. All it needs to know is, hey, how can I use this? How does this correlate with other information that I'm getting on other data cables um, so that I can put together a picture of what's happening in the world? And this is the idea of sensory substitution. And the first demonstration of this was, was actually in the late 1800s. Um, but the first uh, published demonstration was in 1969, where a scientist named Paul Bakke Rita put blind people uh, in a chair that had a solenoid grid that would poke them in the back. And he would put things in front of a video camera, like let's say a telephone in front of the video camera, and they would feel the telephone poked in front of their back. Or he'd put a face in front of the camera, and they'd feel a face poked in their back or whatever shape. And they would feel it. And people got really good at being able to tell what was in front of them, this was people who were blind, they could feel what was in this, the skin of their back and figure out how to see that way. So this was an example of pushing visual information through the, you know, through touch and people could figure out what was going on. And so uh, my lab got very interested in sensory substitution with hearing loss. So we built, originally it was a vest with vibratory motors on it and it would capture sound. And then the sound would get translated into patterns of vibration on the skin. And what we were doing essentially is breaking the sound into frequencies from high to low and representing them on different spots on the skin. And that's what your inner ear does, of course. Your cochlea is just capturing sound and breaking it up from high to low frequency, shipping it off to the brain in, in spikes. And then you feel like, oh, you're hearing my voice. So that's what we did. Um, I presented that at TED um, about six years ago and then spun this out of my lab as a company. And uh, in the meantime, what we've done is we've shrunk this down to a wristband. So the wristband has vibratory motors around it and we can capture sound and turn it into patterns of vibration on the skin. And people who are totally deaf, you know, severe profound hearing loss, can, uh, can come to understand what is happening in the outside world in the auditory world by having that information pushed in through their skin, gets to their brain, their brain figures out the correlations. For example, you watch a dog's mouth and you feel the barking on your skin and you, your brain puts it together and says, oh, okay, I get it. And you, you, know, you slam the door, you ring the doorbell, you watch a you know, baby's crying, you clap your own hands, whatever you figure out what, how these things are related and your brain comes to hear through your skin. It's unbelievable so how you've turned the skin into the, uh, substituting the cochlea, basically. 
Exactly right. We've just taken it from the ear and pushed it onto the skin. That's exactly what we're doing. Right. So I'm curious to know about the Buzz uh, product that, that you've just described, the worn on the wrist. Um, uh, primarily, our audience is made up of hearing care professionals and people that wear hearing aids and cochlear implants. Uh, could you maybe share with us a couple of examples of somebody that maybe was wearing an implant or a hearing aid and how Buzz uh, complemented or supplemented their existing technology? Yes, we, you know, the truth is that I originally uh, felt and, and still feel in some way that, that this is a replacement for cochlear implants or hearing aids. But a lot of people, a lot of our customers have told us that they wear both and find a lot of value out of that. So what, what several people have told us is that this, they feel this gives them three dimensional hearing. And all they mean by that is they can see something like lips moving. They hear something through their tech through their hearing aids or cochlear implants, and they feel information on their buzz on their wrist. And collectively, these three things sharpen the probability distributions for them so that they really feel like they're getting a much clearer sense of what's going on. Because the brain is fundamentally multi-sensory. What it's trying to do is understand what's going on in the outside world through any of these channels of information that it can pull in. So if you've got three different ways that you're trying to verify what is getting said, that helps people enormously. So sort of to my surprise, it turns out a lot of our customers wear this in conjunction with hearing aids or cochlear implants. Right. And I, I think that you've developed something for tinnitus as well called Duo, a program. Can you talk, tell us about that? Yeah. So we launched this one year ago. Um, this is based on bimodal stimulation, which just means you're hearing sounds and you're feeling something on your skin at the same time. And this wasn't our idea. This was originally developed at the University of Michigan and then uh, in Ireland, uh, some groups had done this. And, and what it is, <clears throat> is the way they did it is they played sounds and they did shocks on your tongue at the same time. And believe it or not, this drives down tinnitus. Why? It's because what you're doing essentially is teaching the brain that external sounds are verified with this other stimulation, this other stimulation on your, you know, on your skin or your tongue. Mm -hmm. But your internal sounds, your tinnitus, doesn't get verified. It doesn't lead to any kind of shock on your tongue. And so your brain learns the difference as a matter of brain plasticity. It learns the difference between external and internal sounds. So we decided to try this with, um, you know, on the skin, um, one of the audiologists on our medical board, Kevin Levy, who's just terrific, um, he said, hey, why, you know, look at these papers. Why don't you try this with the wristband? So we tried it and it works perfectly. It works just as well. And by the way, I'll just mention it's, you know, it's much cheaper and much easier to just ship the wristband to somebody at their house. They do this thing 10 minutes a day. They listen to tones, boop, 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 boop. They're feeling it on their wrist. 10 minutes a day is sufficient to drive tinnitus down. I should mention for clarity, it's not, it's not a cure. It doesn't, uh, you know, none of our devices make tinnitus go away entirely, but it, as measured by the tinnitus functional index, it drives it down by about a third, the, the aversiveness of the tinnitus and people find great value at it. I mean, all the people, you know, we've got many thousands of customers using this right now and they find it, it works for about 87% of people, for about 13% of people, it doesn't. We're still exploring which flavors of tinnitus it doesn't work for. We don't know. Mm -hmm. But just as a side note, what, what we've done as a company to account for that is we have a 30-day money-back guarantee. So you try for 30 days. If you don't like it, you just send it right back at zero cost. So, um, but what, yeah. So for the 87% of people for whom it works, they find this extremely valuable and well, super easy. Well, and I think our audience, many of them are hearing care professionals who deal with tinnitus patients all the time. So I'm sure they're going to be pleased to hear that there's another option out there that's got that kind of data to back it up. Where can people, do you have a website? Uh, where can people learn or even order these products? Yeah, it's neosensory.com. So neosensory is the company. And um and, uh, and we've got all the information and the science and the papers and stuff on, on the website. And by the way, I'll mention, so when you go to Neosensory, you see two products. There's the product Buzz for people with severe profound hearing loss. And there's the Tinnitus product, the Duo for Tinnitus. But we have a third one that's just about to come out, uh, probably end of this quarter. Mm -hmm. And that is for high frequency hearing loss. Um, and so... 
um, you know, as, as we know, as people get older, they're losing their high frequencies, but the rest of their hearing is fine. And so we have spent about the last three years developing a killer solution for this. So what this required was developing entirely new things in machine learning and AI. What we have now is on the wristband, the wristband listens in real time for high frequency phonemes. So Fs and Ss and Ts and Ds and things like that. Mm -hmm. It listens in real time. And when it hears one, it buzzes a different motor in a different way. It says, oh, I just heard an F. Oh, I just heard a B. Oh, I just heard an S. And what happens is, you know, your ear is taking care of all the low frequency stuff just fine. The wristband is clarifying which were the high frequency phonemes. And your brain within about three weeks can understand this completely. And our, we've been running test subjects now for about six months. They say that after three weeks, it's like wearing a, a pair of eyeglasses on their wrists and that their, you know, their spouses and their bosses and whatever yell at them when they don't wear their wristband. They say, hey, you're not wearing the wristband today. So this is a killer solution for high frequency hearing loss. Why? Because it's cheaper than hearing aids. It's, um, you know, it's just something you wear on your wrist. You're not putting something on your head. And, um, and you know, it hasn't escaped our notice that, uh, that some people don't like wearing hearing aids. For example, my mother <laughs> needs a right. hearing aid and doesn't like wearing it because it's socially... Mm -hmm. Um, right. There's a lot of uh, stigma still involved with hearing aids and stuff. Like exactly that, right? right. So this, you know, this wrist thing, it's just like a fitness tracker. Nobody well, knows. That's unbelievable. Yeah. It's just the uh, cl Clarify algorithm. Clarify, exactly. Yeah. Well, the Neosensory Clarify, and it'll come out in about, yeah, about two or three months from now. Well, I, that's going to be, uh, uh, I think a lot of people are going to take notice of that. That's great, great information. Yeah. Um, yeah. One, now I wanted to kind of pick your brain uh, as a neuroscientist around the concept of uh, uh, acclimatization, neuroplasticity as it relates to hearing aids. So I kind of want to go away from what we've been talking about, just kind of as we move towards the end of our time together. Um, I think it would be really valuable for our viewers who are primarily hearing care professionals to fit that fit hearing aids. If you could kind of get, provide some insight in how long it takes an older person, let's say who has a moderate hearing loss to get acclimated to their hearing aids, what kind of insights would you want to share with professionals who routinely fit hearing aids on an older population? So hearing aids are a, a, a wonderful invention. I mean, they've, you know, they've revolutionized so much of the world, but one of the problems is for the most part, what they're doing is just making sounds louder. And of course, as we know, when you get older, you're, the tuning of your cochlea gets muddier. And so what a lot of people experience is, okay, here's something that's louder and muddy. Um, and so um, it, it's not so much an issue of plasticity about getting used to the hearing. It's, although, although it is, you know, it is, it's getting used to, okay, how do I interpret the new sounds? Um, but, but instead it's just, Hey, we're going to make this cochlea do some extra work. We're going to really pound the information in there. Um, as opposed to with the wristband, for example, it really is a matter of brain plasticity because you're learning an entirely new signal. So with hearing aids, it's, it's slightly less of a issue of plasticity. The only, the only sense in which brain plasticity uh, is involved there is the, the massive importance of people being out in the world and, and using their hearing aids. Um, and obviously one of the things that happens that we all see is as people lose their hearing, sometimes their social lives shrink as a result because it's just, it's less comfortable for them to be around a lot of speech. And, um, and the most important thing with hearing aids or the wristband or anything is to be getting practice for your brain, to be out there in the world, having the social pressure of understanding a conversation and getting the practice as a result of that. Well, and then thank you for that, because I think that I'll just, I've over the last 30 years for a lot of hearing aids. And I think it's good to hear that from a neuroscientist that it takes somebody that's wearing them some time out in the environment to kind of get used to them. I think sometimes we lean too hard on the technology thinking it's going to solve all the problems when it's really a matter of the person wearing them and kind of being dedicated for a period of time to, get rewired, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And by the way, this is one of the challenges we're always, you know, both with hearing aids and also with our wristbands, the, the thing, uh, for example, with the clarify the fact that it takes three weeks before it's really crystal clear. Mm -hmm. What we have to do is tell people 
you know, look, here's, you know, we're going to gamify this. We're going to make these things. We wear it and we, we keep track of your usage every day. We give you little points and whatever, because it's super important because otherwise people put it on for the first day and they think, eh, I'm not getting anything out of it. And yeah. So with, they need to know with, with any technology, <laughs> I think all of the insights from neuroscience and psychology and elsewhere in marketing, probably all the insights about gamification and making people stick with something are absolutely critical. Well, it's good to hear from somebody outside of our profession in audiology and hearing care. So thank you. Um, as we wrap things up here, uh, Professor Eagleman, I wanted, if you could maybe share again, the name of the, the, your website and the name of the tinnitus and the high frequency, all of the stuff that you have, I think people need to be reminded of, of all that. Great. Yeah. It's called Neosensory as in new senses, neosensory.com. And uh, <clears throat> the wristband for severe profound hearing loss or moderate, it's called the buzz. For tinnitus, it's called the duo, the Neosensory duo. And for the thing that we are going to release soon for high frequency hearing loss, it's called the Neosensory Clarify. Great. Well, I, I, I know you're a really busy guy. We're happy to have you for even 20 minutes or so. So uh, thanks again for your time. And uh, maybe yeah. somewhere down the road, we can uh, catch up with you again. Terrific. Thank you, Brian. Right. Terrific to talk to you.